Thank you. Just looking for a slightly sharper. I also would like to make some announcements. Number one is that my group, the project group, should also meet with me after the last lecture today. I guess this is a regular saying. We, another announcement is that the lecture notes, if you have any comments, please send them to me. These are joint works with Tom Ward and we would like to further improve them and maybe make them more complete at some point. The discussion we had on the microlocal lift goes back to work of Wolpert. I didn't say that before, but I want to point it out. And everything else I'm explaining goes back to Elon Lindenstrauss, which you know, except the entropy portion that we will talk about today a bit goes back to work of Bougain and Lindenstrauss. Okay, so we discussed the Hecke operator and we introduced for this discussion the P plus one regular tree because in the modular surface there is for every point in the tree in the modular surface or in the unit tension bundle of the modular surface there is an attached tree consisting just of the dots that I draw the edges are they are not there they're just combinatorial structures. And then in, you take twice that point, you take that point over two, which is I guess here, and then the point over two plus one half, and those are the points. And below this point, you again have two points. And the orientation of the, of the vector never changes, except that's not the truth, because when you apply the isometry to draw these things again in the fundamental region, then the direction of the vectors do change. Okay, so we have this P plus one regular tree. Let's forget the modular surface for a minute. In the picture, P is always two, otherwise I really can't draw it. And then we started the operator SP, which is just a summing operator over the neighbors, right? So sp of f at v is equal to the sum over all w's that are adjacent to v of f of w. Now, we had very complicated recurrence formulas, but let me remind you of the very, very basic case of this recurrence formula, which was contained, but I didn't write down last time. When you look at sp squared, what do you get? You sum over the neighbors, the function that sums over the neighbors, right? What you get? Well, you get the distance to neighbors, which I write as sp squared. And you get also the identity. You also sum, when you sum over the neighbors of this guy, you also sum over the, of the value, sum the value at the origin. And when you do it here, you also sum at the value at the origin and so on you get plus p plus 1 times the identity. That's the, that's the simple case of the recurrence relation that we discussed yesterday. There's a corollary to this, which maybe I want to point out. If, if we denote the eigenvalue of summing over the distance two neighbors by lambda p squared, then, and we denote by lambda p the eigenvalue that corresponds to summing over the neighbors, then lambda p squared is equal to lambda p squared plus p plus 1. Which tells you something. It tells you that it can't be that both lambda p and lambda p squared are small. Right? Because the difference is of size p plus 1. And that's a very basic observation, but it's actually a very useful basic observation. We'll come back to that later. So, I still want to finish the discussion of the Hecke recurrence because I haven't defined the recurrence. This was the main 
estimate for L2 estimate for the values of the function on a large sphere in the tree. So we have an eigenfunction f, we some we look at the L2 norm on a ball in the tree and compare it to the value of the function at the origin of the ball. And there's an absolute constant, and then there's a statement here, an n. So when we let n, n is the radius of the ball, when we let n grow, well this is saying that the L2 norm grows, at least linearly. This is actually a quite weak estimate, because there are exponentially many elements in the ball, so it's a very weak thing, but it's a uniform thing. Uniform in the eigenfunction, uniform in the eigenvalue, even uniform across the prime, which isn't that important for us, but very uniform. This constant is completely independent of everything. And this implied with you, by using self-adjointness of the Hecke operator and the whole setup, how the, how the tree sort of sits inside the modular surface, it sort of uses this picture, implied that when you integrate over the neighbors, when you apply to a positive function the Hecke operator up to distance n in the Hecke tree, the summing operator up to distance n in the Hecke tree, then you get this linear growth in comparison to the integral of the function for a micro local lift. So, what's recurrence? Recurrence is the following you take a probability space, you take a group action. You have some group acting on some space. It's a very general definition. Then, but I want my group to be not compact, otherwise the whole definition doesn't make much sense. For recurrence to hold somehow something needs to go to infinity. And then there's the following picture. You have your big space, you have some open subset or some Borel subset, it needs to be a Borel subset. And it has positive measure, say, with respect to the measure we're working with, and then we look at what the group does. The group may produce a tree or whatever, it's not important for the definition. And then it may or may not happen that a point in the set returns to the set after a long time. And the definition says this should actually happen infinitely often for bigger and bigger elements of the group, at least for almost every point in the measurable set B. So it's it's a very weak thing because, because we don't really ask for much relationship between the measure and the group action. The, the measure doesn't have to be preserved. If we have a non compact group acting and it preserves the measure, then it satisfies the recurrence. That's sort of a pigeonhole principle in, in a Gothic theory. It's a very easy, the first theorem in a Gothic theory that you would ever learn if you learn a Gothic theory. That's, the very basic fact. If we have invariance, then we have recurrence. But we are not, that's, that's a much weaker conclusion somehow. And here we are just ask, asking for the very weak conclusion. Here's the theorem. When we take the unit tangent bundle of the modular surface, we take our micro local lift of, of, the, of a sequence of eigenfunctions. Then the weak star limit, the micro local lift, is recurrent under the group action. Well, what is the group action? That, hmm. There's some cheating here. X is this SL2C quotient out from SL2R. But we also said that this is itself a quotient of a bigger space, namely of PGL2C bracket 1 over P, quotient out from PGL2R cross PGL2 QP. And, and this is a group that acts. PGL2 QP acts on this space and actually is the guy that produces the tree, right? If the orbit of this PGL2 QP in that set, after projecting it to this 
unotension bundle is precisely the tree that I had on the other picture, sitting inside the modular surface for every point that I have here. And which lift I do is not so important. I mean, I can start with a point here. I can choose a, a point here that goes to this point, then take its orbit, and then take the image down to the unotension bundle, and then I get, then I get the tree. And in the definition of recurrence, I really don't need the group action. I only need the orbit of the group. And the orbit exists here too, so I can, I can say the micro local lift which lives on this space, I want this to be recurrent under this group action. And you can, there are various ways of making this turn precise, and there's one in the notes, and you could also say, just take this measure here and lift it in however way you want to a measure here. That lift might not be unique. You can take the PGL2 CP invariant measure lift. There's a, there's a unique lift from this measure here to this level measure here if you require PGL2 CP invariance, but that's not important. If one lift is recurrence under this definition, then all lifts would be recurrent under this definition. It's really the recurrence property here is really a property of the measure on the quotient and not a property of the measure on the lift. So why is this true? Why is this true? It's true because of this estimate. I stated it here for continuous functions of compact support because I, I used a limit, but then this statement actually implies itself for all measurable functions. So this, this is precisely the reason we have recurrence. Let me convince you of that. You have your modular surface, you have a measurable set. And I pretend it's a small ball or a subset of a small ball. I can, I can chop a measurable set into measurable subsets of small balls. And if I know the statement for these, then I know the statement. And then I draw these, the tree that is attached to it. And I, I look at the characteristic function of this ball or the subset of the ball. That's a measurable function that I can plug into this statement here. So I get sum, I get the integral of the sum from k equals zero to n of sp to the k, I get precisely what I have there. But the integral of f with respect to mu is just mu of b. Now, suppose the tree never comes back to b. The tree just keeps making this its thing and never comes back to itself. Suppose this happens. That would be bad, right? That would be the opposite of recurrence, sort of. Then, this quantity is actually never bigger than 2, and never bigger than 1. Because if, if this tree somehow branches in some way and then comes back to here and this thing comes back to here, then you can actually show that there's a loop and that loop actually brings some points here back to B, which is what we wanted to show anyway. So if the points in B don't come back to B, then you actually never see one of these images of this ball intersect any other image of this, this ball in this space. So then this is, this here is just the sum of the characteristic functions of other balls. P translates of B. So there, there are a bunch of other balls that are these things here. I get p plus 1 to the p times p to the n many if I look at the distance n plus 1 neighbors and I get a really a large number of characteristic functions here and either these sets are disjoint and then this is bounded by 
one or the overlaps, which is what I want to show. If this is bounded by one, then the left hand side is bounded above by one. But that pushes down the measure of, of B to be zero because N grows. Right? What I get is the inequality, let me write it down a bit cleaner, one greater equal integral greater equal C naught N mu of B. If there are no overlaps at all, I get this inequality. And that forces the measure mu of B to be zero. So this gives you recurrence rather quickly, and this comes from that estimate for eigenfunctions on the tree, which used all the Chebyshev polynomials of second kind and the whole structure of the tree. Okay. Any questions to that portion? Now comes entropy, finally, some people say. What's the entropy? The entropy, I would like to compare it to the integral. If you have never seen the definition of the Lebesgue integral, you would wonder why you would ever consider such an ugly thing, right? Entropy is kind of similar. If you haven't seen it before, the definition is something weird to swallow, but then then you sort of develop a theory to it and you prove the analog of dominated convergence and you prove this and you prove that and then you see why why this expression is very useful and how it relates to other things and so the beginning is a bit dry but I'm trying to make it quick what is it we take a partition of a probability space countable say and then for any partition we can define this quantity here it, it measures the average information you're going to get if you're told where a point lies in with respect to the partition elements. So for instance, if you have a partition into, into 2 to the n, or just n elements, capital N elements, if you have a partition into capital N elements and all the partition elements are of equal size. Then you do this calculation and you immediately see that the entropy is log n. And that's sort of the maximum you can achieve for entropy with a partition that has n elements. So there are lots of um, subconvexity in the arguments, but actually these are just convexity of the logarithm function or the convexity of the function x log x. So th this type of convexity that is used here is a bit easier than the other convexities that were mentioned. Now, this was static. There was no dynamical system. There was no dynamics. But now we make it a bit more interesting. We bring in a measure preserving transformation like the geodesic flow on the modular surface and we refine the partition after moving the partition with itself, um, with the geodesic flow. So you take the pre-image of the partition, you get a different partition, and you refine this with your original partition. And you keep doing this a few times, and then you calculate the entropy, the average information, and then you divide by the length of the time interval that you used, because obviously this partition will be more complicated than the original partition. Obviously, it will tell you more information, it will tell you more about the space than the original partition. So often this thing goes to infinity. So we don't want to take the limit of the entropy, we want to normalize with respect to what time interval we used. And that's what this is, and the limit always exists, and this is just the definition of the refinement. I mean, if you have two partitions, you can take the common intersections of an element here and an element here, and you get a partition. And that's the notation for it. Is there any uncertainty about what, what this is? Are we assuming x is a property? Yes. So if there's escape of mass, we would first renormalize the measure to a probability measure, and then, and if there's a first complete escape of mass, we would just stop proving something. 
because dynamic somehow doesn't, in this context at least, doesn't help you to go, to rule out escape of mass. Not quite true. If you have optimal information about entropy, then you can actually rule out escape of mass. But the entropy that we can prove will not be optimal. It will be just positive, and then you can't get that there's no escape of mass by dynamical means. So it seems maybe you have a clever idea. So what's the ergodic decomposition? We take a measure that's invariant under transformation. It may not be ergodic, but there's there's Choquet's theorem. Choquet's theorem says if you have a compact convex set in a Banach space, say, then you can write any point in this convex set as a generalized convex combination of the extremal points. And you can prove that if you have an invariant, if you have the set of all invariant measures on a compact set, then this is a compact convex set in the space of measures with respect to the weak star topology, but never mind. Hence, you can apply Choquet's theorem. What does it tell you? It tells you that any invariant measure can be written as a convex combination of invariant and ergodic measures, because the ergodic measures are precisely the extremal points on the, in the space of invariant measures. You can actually do this within the space. You can use the same probability space and the same measure as the domain for the convex combination that you want to take. So the function looks like this. There's, uh, for every x you can, no, almost every x, every, every time you say every, I quite likely mean almost every. For almost every x in the space, you can associate to it an ergodic measure. That's a consequence actually of the point by the ergodic theorem. And when you write it this way, you can write the following formula, which is looks very simple, but there's a bit to it. I mean, one has to prove it and it's not terrible, but it is a bit of a work. Which says, if you have a non-ergodic measure, you can look at its entropy for the transformation. And you can also decompose the invariant measure into ergodic measures. And you can look at the entropies of those invariant measures, of those ergodic invariant measures. That's what you see here. And you can also take the average of those entropies with respect to those changing measures, right? x is an x and nu x e is some measure that depends on x and you calculate its entropy, you get some number between 0 and infinity and when you in the average that over the space you get precisely the entropy of the original measure. It's a very nice clean formula that we will use because now we can now we can Finally, understand what this. Yes? Uh, what is an measure? Uh, there are two definitions of an ergodic measure. Thank you for asking. Um, one is it's an extremal point in the set of invariant measures. Yes, you fix a transformation. You fix a space, you fix a transformation, you fix. Yeah, that's about it. And then you look at the space of invariant measures. And that's a convex set because you can take convex combinations and you get new invariant measures. And if you take a convex combination, the the point, the, the measure you get in the middle will somehow be not as interesting at, as the extremal points. Hence, we are interested in the extremal points because they would gasify the whole space somehow, the, the whole space of invariant measures. That's one definition. The second definition is that if you have uh, if you, have, you have your x, your b, or else that measure and transformation, this is ergodic if a in b t inverse a equals a, 
So if I have an invariant set, then this in measure of this invariant set should be trivial, should be zero or one. And that's the set zero one, not the interval zero one. T is a godic with respect to this measure if this is satisfied, or the measure is a godic with respect to the transformation if this is satisfied. It means the same thing. And we are fixing the transformation, uh, namely the geodesic flow, but we are thinking of varying measures. Hence, it's nice to talk about in ergodic measures because the transformation is given anyway. Okay, there is another important theorem, the shannon mcmillan Priman theorem, which in some sense is the pointwise ergodic theorem for ergodic theory. I uh, know for entropy theory. So it's the there's a point where the theorem, and then there's this entropy discussion, and there's actually a combination of the two, and that's this Shannon McMillan Priman theorem. And there's only one thing I should explain, namely this notation here. I definitely have to, have to say something about this. If I have a partition of X, then I write for the, this is the element of eta that contains x. So what do I do here? I take an unknown partition countable, but with finite entropy, which just means that this infinite, potentially infinite sum should converge. Then I can refine this partition under the time, under the geodesic flow, say, n times and get a new partition. And then I can look at the partition element that contains my point x. That's probably a very small set. And I'm interested in the measure of that set. Well, why I'm interested in it? Because of that theorem. The measure of that set decays because the set decays. And I can take the logarithm and then divide by n, take minus because the set gets smaller and smaller, so the measure gets smaller and smaller. So I have a positive number here. And this positive number converges to the entropy as n goes to infinity. To the entropy of the ergodic component that is associated to the point x. Yeah, this takes really a bit of work. But it's a well known theorem from, from the ages where, we, where the entropy theory was developed. I mean, this is around 1960 and up, somehow was entropy being refined and further refined. And this is a very important theorem in that context. And yes? Yes. So when you have a transformation on a space, you can look at the point and you can look at its orbit. You get a sequence of the edges are not there just as before. So this point travels around somewhere and, and has some orbit. You can take a function and average it over a piece of the orbit. The point where the Gothic theorem says that this converges. Almost surely. For almost every x, that time average converges to some expression. If you know that this converges to the space average, then the Gothic hypothesis is satisfied and the measure is Gothic. But it may not converge to the space average. Like, for instance, if we talk about this horizontal translation, then, and we have a bump function here, then this point will not converge to whatever the integral of this bump function is, because the bump function is somewhere else, and the orbit never touches the bump function. 
right? However, if the bump function is here, then the orbit doesn't mention, does realize this. So it's a bit of work after you've proven the point was a Gothic theorem, but this, this object here, this actually converges to this ergodic component. So the ergodic component attached to the point X describes precisely the asymptotic distribution of the orbit of X. And it's general fact that if this converges, then the limit measure will be a T invariant measure. But it's actually also true that almost surely the limit measure will be an ergodic measure. That requires more, more discussions. It's not immediate from the point as a Gothic theorem, but uses the point as a Gothic theorem. And this is the measure that is used here in the discussion of entropy. And that gives you a quantity that depends on x. But so does the left hand side, so we are okay. Okay, now we have all the, finally we have the assumptions clarified in the theorem that Elon uses and that I will use as a black box. So the theorem was if we have a measure mu on x equal SL2Z SL2R or some similar quotient that satisfies invariance under A under the geodesic flow, satisfies Hecke recurrence, is Hecke recurrent with respect to some prime and satisfies entropy, namely that all ergodic components have positive entropy. Then the measure is the measure we all love. The uniform measure on the unit tangent bundle of the modulus surface. So it's a classification theorem and that's the micro local lift. That was, this was the discussion of the, the tree structure for a prime and the Chebyshev polynomials helped us to establish the recurrence property. And this is what we currently discuss. And what we want is that this quantity here on the left has a positive limit for almost every x. Right? That's the last condition here. What does that mean that this converges to a positive limit? Well, it means. What is the next? It means that. We want something like mu of I write down this thing without the log. What I want is that this is say less or equal than e to the minus n delta. If I establish that. I established precisely what I want here, namely that the right hand side is positive. It's at least greater or equal to delta. Right? If if I manage this for delta greater than zero, then Right. Yeah. 
This is what we're interested in. We want to show that this has a positive limit. That just means we want to show that this decays at exponential speed. So entropy is related to exponential decay of small sets. Here we have, uh, here we use the dynamics to sort of get smaller and smaller sets. That's important. I mean, otherwise the, the dynamics isn't part of the picture if we But maybe let me explain to you how we expect this set to look like for the geodesic flow. It's not, this is again a bit of work, but that was known, I mean, that goes back to Blade Rabier and maybe later by Young and Pesin. They all were interested in finding good partitions for certain smooth dynamical systems and this case here is much easier than all of this general theory because it's just a geodesic flow on the modular surface. It's, it's uniformly hyperbolic, it's very concrete. And with the right psi, this partition, or this atom that contains that contains the point X looks like, and of course this needs to be made more precise, but don't have the time to do this and I also don't have the time to find the correct partition here. But this set here looks like X times, and then I multiply it on the right by a set, which I define using a subset of the Lie algebra. So, the Lie algebra has three directions, the u plus, the u minus, the h, the geodesic flow. The geodesic flow of course commutes with the h, right? I mean, they, they are the same direction, they, they commute with one another. Um, let me also change the, the discussion here a little bit. This was discussed one-sidedly, I can also discuss this in two sides at once. So I can also go, say, from minus n plus 1 to plus n minus 1. This, the decay of this would again relate to entropy. I change it. The entropy would then twice, uh, there would be a factor 2 appearing on the right because I go in two directions instead of one. Or I divide by the actual length of the interval that I use on the left. Same thing. And then the answer is a bit more symmetric. What do I need to do? I need to take e to the minus the interval minus e to the minus n e to the minus n around u plus plus the interval minus e to the minus n e to the minus n around u minus plus the interval minus 1 1 in the direction of h. So that's, it's not a, a ball, right? It's a smeared out ball in the direction of the geodesic flow. <coughs> and that's the hyperbolic structure of the geodesic flow. Because of the hyperbolic structure, typically that set, when I, I'm good in choosing the partition psi, typically this set will be contained in this set. Contained is all I need because if I find an upper bound for this, then I have an upper bound for this, and then I have a lower bound for entropy. So, I need to estimate the size of the measure of these weird looking sets. They are the tubes. They are tubes. They are flat in two directions. They are very small in two directions and they have a fixed length in, in one direction. And this is what I need to estimate. Now, maybe I hope to come back to this a bit, but let me switch the dynamical system and now talk about an easier dynamical system where I can maybe show you how you could show an estimate like this. But it's really a much easier system. So Fürstenberg asked around 1967, 
What are the invariant and ergodic probability measures on the circle group? Just take the one dimensional circle. And let's look at the following dynamical system. Multiply by two and by three. And all the products. That's an action not of a single transformation, but it's two commuting transformations. It's a, it's a group action of the group n squared, right? So it's definitely something that one can consider. And he asked what are the invariant and ergodic probability measures for that. And what is known is a theorem of Rudolph, which then was extended by Johnson. So if you have an invariant measure and a Gothic for some multiplicative semigroup that contains two and three on the torus, and if in addition entropy is positive, then the measure must be the Lebesgue measure. So that's that's much older, and that's sort of a part of the history of this theorem. I mean, that theorem definitely is there because we knew here that positive entropy helps us to, to prove that something is the Lebesgue measure or the uniform measure. So you could stare at it for a while and see the relationship. There are two independent dynamical systems. Multiplying by two and multiplying by three have something very, have very little in common somehow. If you know what a point looks like or behaves like under times two, this doesn't tell you anything about times three. In fact, it should tell you good things about times three. If the point two is sort of special with respect to times two, then Fürstenberg conjectures that it will be equidistributed with respect to times three. Or at least not so special. So points, if you have a typical point on the counter set, which behaves very concretely with respect to three, then it will be equidistributed when you take the times two dynamical system. That's a special case that was known before of a theorem of host. And there, there are several other theorems in between this theorem and that theorem. Uh, some of them are by Kato and Spazzi and Kalinin, and I was also involved a bit. And now we want to see how, how we could check this assumption, right? This assumption here or this assumption here that appears in both of these theorems. So how can we check this? And I want to check it for the easier dynamical system. Suppose you have a semigroup containing two and three, but much more than that. So suppose you have this property that on an interval of length m, you always have, say, square root m many elements in this multiplicative semigroup. Let's just assume that. Then one can combine the johnson rudolph theorem with the method of Burgen and Lindenstrauss and prove this. And this is sort of a very baby case, but it, it shows how you could, how you could prove positive entropy. So, what's the statement? If you have a same group of polynomial density with positive exponents, so that the exponent doesn't, is not important, but we want it to be positive, then an S invariant and the probability measure on the circle group is either supported on a finite set of rational points or is the Lebesgue measure. Nothing in between, no mentioning of entropy. Right? What we would like to show is that if we have such an invariant measure, and it gives zero measure to the rational points, then we get positive entropy, say, for the times two map. So let's focus on that problem. Okay, so what we are studying is a measure mu on t. 
and we're studying multiplication by two. Now, here, it's not difficult to find the correct position. Everyone would guess the correct position. Psi equal 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1. That's the correct position. And when you define this position, and under the two t's, one is the space and the other is the transformation. When you take the partition, take the pre-image of the partition and refine it with the original partition, what you get is the partition you expect. Why? Because this partition talks about the first digit in the binary expansion. This partition talks about the second digit in the binary expansion. So the refinement talks about the first two digits in the binary expansion. Etc. Etc. So we know perfectly well what what this set here is. It's the interval that has binary endpoints with the denominator two to the n and, and so on. Now we would like that that this interval is is small, right? So we will assume that the interval is bigger or equal than e to the minus n delta for some delta that we will later choose in relationship to the alpha. So we just assume this, that we have a point that satisfies a greater equal inequality. And just so that I don't have to worry where the point lies in, I replace the, the interval by a bigger by a bigger interval that is centered at x. Right? The, this interval has binary endpoints, but I, I want to ignore that. So I just make it a bit bigger. So I assume that the measure of the um, 2 to the minus n ball around x has this inequality. If that's true, then that's also true because I this set contains that set. Now, now I do something weird. In algorithmic theory, you should never do this. At least not if you're using a non-invertible map. I'm taking the images of the sets. Right? In the, what's a measure preserving transformation? A measure preserving transformation is one where the set and the pre-image have the same measure. And nobody ever tells you something about how the image of a set behaves. Except there's a trivial corollary of measure preservingness that the image has at least that much mass. Right? Because it, the image has the property that it con its pre-image contains the original thing. So, this tells you that when you take the image under any multiplication map under any of the S's in the semi-group that preserves the measure of the ball around X, you have the same inequality. Now I'm, I'm summing over S in S intersected with some range of S's. I don't want to sum over all the S's because then I get definitely an infinity I just want to sum up to capital M. This expression, and I get greater equal M times e to the minus N delta. So now I have uh, one more variable in the picture. I have, what do I have? I have alpha from, from here, from my assumption. I'm assuming the exponent of the semigroup is positive. I have a delta which I haven't specified, and I have an M which I haven't specified. Okay, and what do I want? I want that this is greater than 1.
That's what I want. Ah, no, thank you. M is wrong, right? It's M to the alpha. Yes, form precisely over there. What do I want? I want that this is greater than one. Why? Because if this is greater than one, then I get to know something about the point. Because then these sets that I have here can't be disjoint. Right? If the sets here would be disjoint, the, measure, the sum of the measures would be equal to the measure of the union less or equal than one. Because I'm for probability measure on the space T. So if this is greater than one, then I get to know that image points, images of these things intersect. And then I will deal with what that means. So I just write down some weird formula that tells me that this is greater equal to zero uh, than one. So I define the M as some function of the alpha and the delta. Um, two, why not? Two e to the N delta over alpha. And then this happens. Check. So I get from this overlaps. And when I write down what these overlaps mean, I, I get S times X was the center point that I'm interested in, plus something small is equal to some S prime, which is again something in the semigroup, times X plus something small, plus some integer. I'm, I'm replacing my X, which lives in the torus, with the X that lives in the real numbers. Right? The overlap happens in the torus, and that means an equation up to an integer in the real numbers. And what's the V? The V has, and the V prime, they have sizes bounded by 2 to the minus n. That's what it should be. Because I've said my dynamics that I want to use is times 2. This is small. This is small, this is an integer, s is a natural number, s prime is a natural number, but they are different natural numbers. So out of that, I conclude x is close to some element in Q. It's an elementary calculation, and this is what it means, and the answer is that x is equal to s minus s prime in the denominator, s prime v prime minus s v plus k divided by s minus s prime. So this is an element in Q. The v and v prime are small, right? So if the m isn't that big, then the s is here not big, and then this whole thing will be not big. And concretely, what do I get? with the right choice of the... Now there's another thing that I need to fix, right? I defined already what the M is in relationship with the alpha and the delta. The alpha was given, but I haven't yet defined what the delta is. So now let me just write down some formula for the delta that I want to use. Delta is equal to alpha log 2 divided by some favorite large number like 5. And then what you conclude is that this here is tiny. It's less than, maybe less, less, n to the minus 4. So I fix this definition of delta in terms of alpha. And then I calculate what all my estimates mean. They mean that this disturbance is less than n to the minus 4. And this is a rational number where s minus s prime is less than m. Now, everyone should cry out now. How could this be? And this is ridiculous, right? Because we have a way too good approximation of, of this number x by a rational number. The error is m to the minus 4. The denominator is just m. That's ridiculous. And if you do this again, if you play this not for n, but for 2n, you get the same result, right? So let me write down the same result. So first let me write down this thing. x is equal to 
q1 over q1 plus o of m to the minus 4. And then you can do this again. This is for, for n. And then you can do this again for 2n. You get a different rational approximation, p2 over q2 plus little o of n to the minus 8, something is squared, when I jump, when I do the same thing for 2n. But it's the same x. And the approximations are so good that actually the rational numbers need to be the same rational numbers because the denominator here is less than m, the denominator here is less than m squared, so even this m squared and the m to the minus 4 is still ridiculous. So you get actually that x is equal to p1 over q1 if you do this infinitely often. But we assume that the measure gives zero measure to the rational functions, to the rational points. No functions there. And that means we have shown for almost every x that this is greater or equal, in the limit greater or equal than delta. I mean, there was some relationship, delta was defined in terms of alpha. If alpha is greater than zero, then delta is greater than zero. And then this quantity on the right is greater than zero. And then we have positive entropy for all ergodic components, actually. I mean, we assume they existed anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so this was an easy application of the bourguin linnenstrauss method to this case. And for the hyperbolic surface, you need to work a bit harder in many ways. You need to work a bit harder because you need to find this partition. But as I said before, it's sort of something that people have done before and it has gone through iterations and, and it's now quite doable. And there are some summer school that I, I and Elon have been teaching uh, that was in 2007 in Pisa and there are some lecture notes for that that are actually ready now and that actually contains the construction of this partition for G mod gamma and I think it's on Elon's website and it should also be online at some point. Okay, so that discussion for the Torus opens two questions. What is the replacement for the polynomial density assumption in the proof of the arithmetic quantum unique ubiquity problem, right? And where do we have extra invariance, right? We, we worked hard to get recurrence under one prime. And the second question is, what is the replacement for rational numbers in, in the unit tangent bundle of the model of the surface? What's a rational number for times two? It's a periodic point. Well, pre-periodic sometimes, but never mind. So, what you should the answer to the second question is closed geodesic, periodic compact orbits of the geodesic flow. And I didn't didn't discuss that because I ran out of time. But it's actually a consequence of the recurrence that the microlocal lift gives zero measure to any periodic, meaning compact, A orbit. That's a nice application of, of the recurrence, because you, you sort of need to discuss quite a few interesting things. If you have a periodic orbit, actually you have a quadratic number field, a real quadratic number field in the background. This real quadratic number field has some primes where that split in the number field. But it also has some primes that don't split in the number field, that are inert in the, in the number field. And recurrence for the inert primes pulls out positive measure on the, on the periodic orbit that is attached to this quadratic number field. It's a nice story. It's in the notes. And also goes back to Elon, but he did this. I mean, 
some observation like this goes back to Rudnik Sanok, but this formulation goes back to Elon, and he did this a bit before, but now it's sort of a consequence of his recurrence theorem, which makes the proof a bit nicer. Uh -huh. <laughs> Another five minutes. <laughs> no, I can use this thing, I guess. Ah, no, a different problem. They ran out of slides. How can this be? I ran out of time too, yes, I know. What else do I want to say? I want to tell you one more thing. Then we can go home. And I already told you, so it should be quick. What's the answer to the first question? What is the replacement of the polynomial density for, for the, the microlocal lift? It's this thing. This thing tells you if you use Cauchy Schwartz just similar to the this thing that I haven't done in the recurrence, how to get from the recurrence relation the, the, estim the estimator on the L2 norm of the function on huge balls, there you use um, Cauchy Schwartz here. You know from this that either lambda p is bigger, bigger square root p, or lambda p squared is bigger, bigger p. So one of the two. One at least holds. And from this you get that when we draw the distance two portion of the tree for the prime p, that the shell of distance one or two, sort of these two, these um, nine points put together have a significant amount of mass in comparison to what mass we have at the origin. Now, in the proof, In this proof here, where I took the image, I didn't use invariance. All I used was that if I have a lot of mass in the ball, then the image ball has also a lot of mass. I can, I can do the same thing with this picture. In one of these things, somehow, I have a significant amount of mass. And if this happens for all primes, which it does, then I have to can produce overlaps of maybe this thing, if I thicken this up a bit and make it a ball, maybe this ball can't be disjoint to this ball. And that's an overlap that's like a rational number. So it's close to something and then after a bit work, we realize it's close to a periodic orbit for the geodesic flow. And then you repeat this for 2n, so to speak, and it becomes even closer to the same periodic orbit because closed periodic orbits, they also have some distance law. They behave like rational numbers. If you have two periodic orbits that are not too complicated, then they must actually be far apart from one another, like two rational numbers with bounded denominators would be far apart from one another. And then the story sort of repeats, it goes the same way, and you prove that if your point is not on a periodic orbit, then you have the exponential decay, and hence you have positive entropy for all the golden components. And now I'm done. Thank you. Yes? Uh, that's uh, that's nose carring, yes, that's the nose carring theorem. So, Peter Pan, we had these bouncing ball measure, uh, bouncing ball pictures in the first talk, where we had the stadium, and then we had the stadium, and then we had some eigenfunction that looked like this, and that's a periodic point, right? 
And something like that is referred to as scarring. That it's, it, the quantum limit sort of behaves like a periodic point.